must be united as God. The epistle reading is from James chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes to your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is my beloved brothers and sisters. Has God not chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is from Mark chapter 7, beginning with the 24th verse. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I grew up um, somewhat regrettably in a non-book family. Uh, my parents were uh, children of the Depression, very hard-working people, but they, weren't read they didn't have books in the house. I never saw them reading books. I didn't grow up around books. I wasn't a reader. I would say as a grown-up, uh, I've made up for lost time. The number of books that uh, I bought, uh, the money that's cost, Lisa and I could have driven to church in Bentleys today. I'll take the books. It's good. I do remember glimpses of growing up deciding reading might actually be a good thing. I remember we were assigned Jack London's book, The Call of the Wild. I didn't really want to read it. I didn't like books, but we were walking about halfway down the steps down into our cinder block basement, and I started reading this book, and I didn't rise until I was done. Hmm? Jack London had taken me off to the Yukon, and I was there with a dog sled and all. It was absolutely amazing. I read another book a couple years later. Uh, by somebody named Jesse Stewart. It's called The Thread That Runs So True, and it's a story about a guy that was a, a teacher in impoverished rural Appalachia. When I finished that book, I said, I'm going to be a teacher in rural Appalachia when I grow up. Books have this power to transform, <coughs> to transform us. I wasn't around books much growing up, but there was one book that I loved. Uh, you're going to have a corny reaction to this, and then I'll correct it. There was one book that I loved as a child, and it was the Bible. And I know you're thinking, oh, that's so sweet. Our pastor loved the Bible when he was a child. Don't get the wrong idea. I didn't know what was in it. I'd not personally read one. But I loved the book. And the reason is, I told you a couple weeks ago that I'm in a book club, and we'd read this book by Marianne Wolf called Proust and the Squid. And it's a book about reading and how your mind is rewired as it reads and, you know, what's dyslexia like and the challenges and that. Fascinating book. One of the things that Marianne Wolf says is that it's, it's really important to put children on your lap and read to them. And it's not about the content of the book, which they may or may not get. She says what it's about is if you put children on your, on your lap and you read to them, they associate reading with being loved. They associate reading with being loved. I love the Bible because my grandparents loved the Bible. I love the Bible because my grandparents put me on their laps and they read the Bible. So I don't know what was in it, but once I was grown, I knew that's the go-to book. Like, that's where I'm going to find what I need to know. That's where I'm going to find the law. That's where I'm going to learn how to be wise. That's where I'm going to learn how to be good. That's where I'm going to figure out what God wants me to do. 
kind of forget this sometimes. We think it's all about intellectual comprehension. I, have a co I had a cousin, she died a few years ago, granddaughter of the same grandparents. She never learned to read, she had Down syndrome and such, but she had a Bible and she clutched it close everywhere that she went and treasured that book, even though she never read a word of it. Uh, the Bible has all this stuff in it, and over time, it's like developing muscle memory. No one Bible reading is going to win the day for you, but over time, we read different things. There's a three-year cycle of readings here at church. If you hear all of them, over time, you cover most of the Bible, the gospel stories, the epistles, the Old Testament. And we develop a muscle memory. We come to know the mind and the heart of God. It's countercultural. It's not like what you hear out there on the street at all. Uh, this uh, letter that we're working through this month, the letter of James. Uh, I love the letter of James. James was the brother of Jesus. This is something to ponder, right? As we think of Jesus as though he is the Messiah striding across the stage of history, but Jesus once was a little boy and he had a brother. And like, you know, they fight over toys, play together. What do they do? James begins his uh, letter by saying this. The two, two important things in James. Here's the first. James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from God the Father. That's so important. There are people that will tell you God does bad things, right? Somebody will always say, oh, God, why did God give my husband cancer? Or why did God cause this car accident? Or I heard somebody the other day, like her husband's been a total schmuck to her, and she had friends telling her, oh, it's God's will. Oh, it's God's will. God doesn't split up marriages. God doesn't give people cancer. God doesn't cause car accidents. God only does good. Every good and perfect, it's part of how you know it's good and that it's from God, not evil. It's good. Second thing about James, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was away last Sunday, and I'm kind of glad because I got to hear Nancy Watson's uh, sermon online. She preached on James. She said something I'd never heard before. She said, James, among the apostles, he, he's kind of the Nike apostle. I never heard that one. Uh, you're thinking I'm going to the Colin Kaepernick thing. I'm not. Don't worry. <laughs> what she said, you're nervous. I can feel it. What she said is, is Nike's like, just do it. So James, is not, he's not the greatest theologian. He's not of the great theologian like Paul or the writer of Hebrews, but James is he's like, just do it. Right? You got God's word and just do it. James says, don't be just hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. <laughs> I read a book recently about the friendship between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, and Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, plays an important role in this. And something that she said often was that wishful thinking is one of our besetting sins. Isn't that interesting? Wishful thinking, we all fall into it, wishful thinking. The Bible doesn't say thou shalt not wishfully think. <laughs> but I think she's right. Wishful thinking is one of our besetting sins. James says be a doer of the word. I think he knew from his brother that we would have this tendency as God's people to over-spiritualize things, to over-emotivize things, that we, that we would take Christianity and say, oh, it's a feeling inside. Oh, it's invisible spiritual realities. James knew better, you see. He grew up with Jesus. They, they did chores together. Their, their knuckles got bloody working in their father's carpentry shop. They knew what it was to be hungry and have to scrape out a meal together. He knew that Christianity was just a practical thing. It's something you do day by day all the time. Being doers of the Word, the, the, there's a way of being a doer of the Word, incidentally, for people like us who are addicted to stress and busyness that's a non-doing uh, Jessica Stevens uh, is going to seminary to uh, study for ordination. She's our director of young adult ministries, and she has a couple of groups of young moms in the church. And I was talking to her the other day. I said, what's that like? And she said, it's interesting. We talked about it. What those groups try to do is to, uh, how do I put it, to help our young moms from feeling the pressure to be uber moms. Do you know what an uber mom is? They must have been attending the earlier services. Uh, Uber moms, you see them all the time. They're moms, and they're, they are, they're amazing. Like, all they get done, they are busy, they are rushing around, they are productive, and they got their children's busy and rushing around, and you can't not be in soccer and ballet and 15 other things, and we're preparing to go to Harvard when you're eight years old or something. And uh, what the groups are about is, like, you don't have to be an Uber mom. 
you, you can chill, you can rest, you can observe Sabbath, you can be still and know that God is God. God didn't make us to be uber moms. God made us to be Christian moms, Christian people. But there's another kind of not doing that, that's a problem. Years ago, Gordon Weekly was the pastor at Providence Baptist over in Cotswold. And uh, Gordon, you know, he was a great preacher, but then he lost it all because he was addicted to drugs. And he wound up on the street. Sad story. But then he recovered from all of that, and he started the Charlotte Rescue Mission, which has done amazing things for so many people. I was with Gordon one time, and he, he shared uh, th this, these words that you may have heard before about Christians not doing. It goes like this. I was hungry, and you formed a group to discuss my hunger. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless, and you preached to me of the spiritual shelter of the love of God. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. You seem so holy. You seem so close to God, but I'm still very hungry. I'm still very lonely. I'm still very cold. James says, be a doer of the word, and that's about loving. And uh, let's just face it, we live in a culture where loving is countercultural. You're going against the grain if you love. Everything out there says hate. Everything out there says be angry. Everything out there says be right, but we're called to love. You know, I've been interested. Uh, since John McCain died, of uh, how people, they seem obsessed with, fascinated by John McCain. I wonder if there's something about McCain that is calling to the better angels in our natures. You know, interesting happened, you know, Cain was diagnosed with this brain tumor and he was out from the Senate for a while. And then the day that he returned, he came onto the floor and uh, Cory Booker, who's a Democrat, McCain's a Republican, Booker, who's a Democrat from New Jersey, uh, hugged him when he came in the Senate chambers. And Booker got dinged for this. Like, how, how dare you embrace the enemy? Can you imagine? Like, what's a fool Democrat saying, how dare you embrace the enemy? Now, let's be sure we're bipartisan here. Something else happened a few years back when they had that hurricane in New Jersey. Uh, President Obama went and Governor Chris Christie was there and Christie embraced Obama. And people ding Chris Christie. How dare you embrace the enemy? I mean, what's wrong with us, right? God calls us to love, not to mimic the stupidity, the anger, the rancor of everybody else. Uh, in the passage uh, that uh, Wiley read to us in such a, a wonderful way, uh, James, as he talks about being a doer of the word, he, he's interested in, in our talk. And next Sunday, we're actually going to talk more about this. You know, what do Christians say? What do we not say? What do we listen to? What do we not listen to? We'll, we'll cover that more. But for this week, uh, James's, James's uh, words are about fawning over the rich. How do we talk about the rich. And he said, oh, we, we're, we're preferential toward... The, the way this plays out actually is so interesting. I remember when Grace was, uh, I don't know how old she was, five, six, something like that, and she was in ballet. And if you've been a parent and you've had a child in ballet, you know how this is. You take them to practice endlessly, and then, and then they have a recital. And it lasts for, I don't know, 12 hours. <laughs> And you, you're burying it as best you can. And finally, it's your child's turn. And little girls come out, and they gallop in a circle, and they do a plie and an achepe, and then they're gone. <laughs> then you have seven more hours. <laughs> it's brutal. So one year, they had a little pre-recital program for just the one small class. So I said, I'm at this. And the teacher's introducing the, the, the dancers, and she says to each one of them, she says, I, I, I want to introduce you, and then I want to ask the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think the right answer is supposed to be a ballerina, <laughs> maybe. And so they come to the first girl, and they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she says, when I grow up, I want to be rich. <laughs> and the poor mom's trying to hide under her chair. The other parents are thinking, please don't let my child say they want to be rich. <laughs> but it occurred to me, as awkward as that moment was, that every parent in that room had children who wanted to be rich because they've talked about being rich as being just the thing. If you just are rich, then it's amazing. Look at those people that are rich. They're just... A and we do this thing, and James says, don't fawn over the rich, and then he adds this other thing. 
James says, has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith? Has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith? I've done an unscientific survey over many years, and I've reported it to you several times. And every time I do, somebody dings me, but it's still right in my unscientific survey, and it goes like this. The people I have met in my life who are the most enthusiastic about God, who have the deepest faith, who are full of gratitude and joy, are the people that have next to nothing. And then I know a lot of people, they've got everything, and they seem to struggle with enthusiasm for God. They seem to struggle with joy. They seem to struggle with gratitude. What's that about? Uh, the, uh, in closing, the, the Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus. This is, this, this is a great point in the story. Jesus, so far, he's only been talking to Jews. Then he ventures further north, and a woman from Syrophoenicia, that's Gentile territory, she's a Gentile, she comes to Jesus because her child is very sick. I mean, that's what moms do. Your child is sick. You, you bring them to God. You plead to God for help. So she comes to Jesus and says, my child is sick. Could, could you heal her? Could you do anything? And Jesus' reaction is stunning because Jesus will say, okay, be healed. Instead, Jesus says, it's not right to give the food of the children to the dogs. Like, what is that? It was Jesus you know, teasing and trying to bring something out of her? Or, or was Jesus kind of learning himself how to be the Messiah? We say that Jesus became one of us, and maybe he thought, God called me to the Jews, Gentiles, I don't know, and then he figured it out, and then he was great for the Gentiles too. Uh, we don't know. What's interesting is the woman's response. How many of you have ever seen women that wear these T-shirts that say, nevertheless, she persisted, Right? And the patron saint of nevertheless she persisted is the Syrophoenician woman. I mean, Jesus has been downright rude to her. She ain't taking no for an answer. She insists, and the way she phrases this eventually, she says, even the dogs get the crumbs under the table. <laughs> even the dogs get the crumbs under the table. Jesus responds and heals her daughter. This crumb business is interesting. I think sometimes as Christians, we know we're supposed to help the poor. We're supposed to do something for people that are hurting. So we brush a few crumbs off, and if they gather them up, we feel pretty noble about them. Yeah. I had some leftover stuff, and that helped a needy person. It's cool. Good. I'm, I'm so noble. <laughs> we kind of do this, but is that what God wants us to do? Is kind of let them have the crumbs, or is God asking for more than that. We had a group from our church, uh, they were up in Asheville uh, two weeks ago. They were attending a conference at the Haywood Street Methodist Congregation, which our church supports. Uh, Brian Combs, the pastor there, he preached here a couple years ago, electrifying. He was absolutely amazing. And the Haywood Street Church in Asheville, you know, if you go to Asheville, you kind of miss it, because Asheville's so cool and so chic, and, oh, it's amazing. But they're poor people in Asheville, they're homeless people in Asheville, they're addicted people in Asheville. Some of them are like, you know, veterans, and they've got post-traumatic stress syndrome, but our government doesn't care for them well, so they're on the street and struggling. So they, anyway, so the Haywood Street Congregation, they reach out to all these people and welcome this stunning, wonderful ministry. One of the things they do is they serve meals, and the way, the way they do meals is pretty amazing. Uh, the norm for meals for homeless, addicted people is you, you serve it you know, just, you know, on a step somewhere, and there's, you know, paper plate and plastic forks and spoons. That seems like the way to do that, right? You economize, but at Haywood Street, they don't do that. When the poor and the homeless there come for a meal, they spread out, like, elegant white tablecloths, and they put nice china on the tables, and the food isn't, you know, your standard spaghetti or hot dogs. <laughs> what they do, they get some of the best chefs in Asheville. You've probably enjoyed their food. And the best chefs in Asheville, they prepare really elegant meals. And their, their philosophy is, it, like, it matters how you treat people. Like, it matters if you treat people like they're somebody. I said this to one person. They said, yeah, if you treat people like they're somebody, they'll probably become somebody one day. And I said, oh, they're already somebody. You see, the Bible talks a lot about feasting. The Bible doesn't talk about, you know, hot dogs and paper plates very much. The Bible talks about a great feast that is the kingdom of heaven. The question is, what do we, what do, we do for God? What do we do 
for people that are hurting. And sadly, what I think we often do is we kind of give God the crumbs. It's like, oh, we've got our stuff, and that's for us. That's for me. That's for my family. I've earned that. Oh, a few crumbs over there for me. That's good. We do that. Sometimes we do this with God, don't we? It's like, well, my time in my life is about me, and I got a few, I got a little bit left. I'll, okay, a little bit for God. Crumbs over there. You know who gets used to getting crumbs, by the way? It's not just the poor. I've talked to some people this week. They go to church here. Some of them are in this room who've been shamed. People have been shamed by somebody. It hurts to be shamed, and what happens when you're shamed is you're like, if I just get crumbs, that's like the most I could hope. Just If I get some crumbs, that's okay. But God doesn't want shamed people to get crumbs. God doesn't want the poor to get crumbs. God doesn't want us to give people crumbs. God doesn't want us to give God crumbs. It's a great feast. Uh, I I was working on my sermon this week. It's hard to do this. And I kept thinking, like, I need a snappy ending, right? That's great. People love it. Like, oh, big climactic ending. I just couldn't think of one. (laughs) So it is not one coming. But I will say this, uh, we did this Bible thing, I don't know, it was 11 or 12 years ago, and after we gave out the Bibles when I was preaching, I said in my sermon, I said, this could be a colossal waste of time and money. And a few parents took exception to that, and said, oh, it's so fun, it's so cute, it's so sweet, and I said, well, yeah, it is cute and sweet, but at the end of the day, this is a colossal waste of time and money if these children don't actually become students of the Bible, and it's actually a colossal waste of time and money for you to bother showing up here if you just keep going about your life and all you ever give God are some leftover crumbs that you have. God wants us to know God, God's mind and God's heart. You don't just intuit this. You learn this, it's through a book. It's why we ask you to join a Bible study group. It's why I teach Bible studies on Wednesday. It's why I send out emails. It's why we do all this stuff, right? It's God wants us to read the book. God wants us to know the mind and the heart of God. And then we become doers of the word. You can't be a doer of the word if you don't know what the word is. Then you just do whatever your biases and preferences are, and that's no better than anybody else in the world. Even if you're a great, terrific person, God calls us to be different. God calls us to be holy. God calls us to be generous. God calls us not to waste our lives and our time trying to get rich or whatever. God wants us to be doers of the Word, (laughs) which is an immense privilege and joy. For that, we give thanks to God.